If you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to the channel. When you do, make sure you hit the notification bell. That means that you will be informed of when a new video has been released. If you would like to take that support one step further, you can do that via Patreon, which is an optional monthly service you can donate money towards the channel. Or you can go over to Kofi. Dot com and for the price of a coffee you can help donate towards the channel as well links for all of those will be in the description of the video and without further ado enjoy the video hello and welcome to football coaching 101 hosted by james and adam from the non-league nosh presented by james bloomfield football coach in non-league football the series in which we will be introducing you to coaches from the professional game gaining their insight and knowledge into the beautiful game that we love. So sit back and enjoy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Football Coaching 101. Uh, my name's James and I'm delighted to be welcomed today by ex Dundee and Rangers striker, followed by Hearts first team coach, John Daly. Uh, thanks for coming on, John. Thanks for having me on, James. I'll just have to correct you. It's Dundee United. I know, I know that will hurt a lot of <laughs> Dundee United fans saying Dundee because of the big rivalry there. So, sorry about that. I'll have to jump in and correct you. No problem. I'm really glad. You, yeah, I'm really glad <laughs> that that will stop any any um, anything online. So, yeah, yeah. Dundee United. Um, and uh, as I've seen, and as we'll go through that as a as a successful time there as well. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go back to the start of, um, rather than your playing career, I'm going to go to the very beginning uh, of coaching for you. Um, in fact, I'm going to go as early as what made you take an interest in coaching um, and maybe how early in your playing career did you start decide that actually coaching could be what you want to do next? Yeah, so um, I started my, my coaching badges, um, I think it was 2011. Um, the SFA ran the B license course. They kind of ran it, you know, alongside the international break. So I was at Dundee United at the time and a couple of uh, my teammates, uh, Sean Dillon and Willow Flood, we, we spoke about going on the B license during this time, uh, during the, the winter, oh, sorry, during the international breaks, because generally we, we normally had time off because we never played during them breaks. So yeah, we um, we spoke to the club and they were quite happy for us to you know take the few days uh, on each international break to go and go and pursue the badges and it was something I really enjoyed. Um, you know, I hadn't done an awful lot of coaching prior to that, so it was kind of you know yeah. just just straight in and you know trying to learn off the the tutors and 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 your peers on the course and you know mm -hmm. it was it was quite daunting I suppose you know you're going from obviously taking instruction and you know, probably just going and taking part in sessions to then having to come up with the idea for the session and then actually come up with the, you know, how you're going to communicate that across to to the the players. And, and to be fair to, to the rest of the, the boys on the course, and, and I'm probably, I'd imagine, you know, 99.9% .9 of people that go on these courses will say the same thing. Everyone was brilliant on the course um, yeah. or very, very helpful. You know, there was a couple of moments where, you know, you maybe forget to put bibs in a certain area or you're missing a player and someone will jump in and help you or maybe, you know, and it's all about learning and, and making mistakes. And, you know, there was plenty of mistakes made and plenty of learning done on them courses. And it kind of just gave me the, the appetite for it, I suppose. And, um, you know, I didn't I didn't probably follow up um, on that because I very much wanted to focus on on my football at the time and yeah. playing. Um so it was probably a few years later then that I actually, um, I probably then started to take a, a real genuine interest. Um, but that mm -hmm. kind of, in 2011, doing the B license with the, the couple of teammates, kind of just gave me, you know, a little taste for it and um, just, yeah, just kind of whet my appetite for it, I suppose, for, for further down the line. Brilliant, brilliant. It's, it's, it's good to hear that, actually. Whilst you're playing, you've you'd already had that thought about um, what's going to be next for yourself and making sure that there's a little bit there's something in place because I've spoken to a coach already um, for, for the listeners that um, that are here uh, who actually finished their playing career and, and really wanted to move away from the game and 
went sort of full circle and it was only years later that they got into coaching and now it's a real real passion so yeah um so it's nice to hear sort of the other end or, or somebody that's still playing uh, i know more and more now um even the youngsters going through the academy are doing their coaching badges because they're trying to take a little bit more care which i think is probably more there now than it ever has been um do you think that ever do you think once you started doing that and you had been on the b license and experienced what it's like to coach um, because you were still playing for about another five years, maybe even six seasons by the looks of my research after that, did it change the way that you sort of participated in sessions or, or looked at your coach and manager? Did you, did you sort of consider that much? Yeah, well, I think what I did, it did do, you know, you know, like anyone that knows Willow Flood will know he's one of the biggest moaners in football and he's one <laughs> of the biggest moaners in training, you know, and he, he would tell you that himself. But what, yeah. what it does do, I think when you're playing and you go and you do these courses, it gives you a greater appreciation for, for how much work and how much effort goes into delivering one session. You know, just, yeah. you know, the, the amount of time that the coach actually puts into to planning um, and then to actually go and execute it. It does, it does give you a greater appreciation for, for that. And mm-hmm. it's funny because that, that course was obviously geared towards players um, that were currently still playing um, to come on the course. And we actually had a couple... Yeah. Um, you know, on the course that, that were a lot younger. We had a, a young boy, James Creaney. I think he was 21, 22 at the time. Um, mm-hmm. And he was actually one of my my partners when you get linked up, you know. And, you know, yeah. he, he was, I think he might have been at Queen's Park at the time. Um, but I just noticed there, um, I think it was yesterday, the day before, that he, he's, he's gone in as the uh, player coach now at Sterling Albion, which is great, you know. So he's obviously wow. made yeah. that foundation to, to get into coaching and, He's sure. he's gone on. He's done his B. He's done his A license now as well. I'm I'm sure, and and he's now doing that while he's still playing, which is which is great. And as, as you said, it's it does give you probably a head start, and it it gives you look. It's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. You know, Definitely. I think people just assume that because you're a player, you're going to go into coaching, and and it is totally different. You know, it is totally different to to playing the game. Um, yeah. But you're right. It did. It gave me a better a better appreciation of everything that went into. To, to set up it also gave probably a you know a better understanding of of different positions and um and then, and again an appreciation for for your teammates and, and the roles that they maybe have to do that, uh, yeah. that are different to you yeah probably in a little bit more detail when you're as a player and you there's all that focus especially on your journey towards reaching becoming a pro and establishing yourself you've got so much focus on yourself as a player that really that, like you say, the appreciation of what the coach is doing and the appreciation of um, what your teammates are doing. It's nice to hear that by doing the course, um, that is something that it actually helps you as a player a little bit as well. So it's really, yeah. really interesting to hear that. Um, I did read a little bit, actually, from a few people that coached you as a player. Um, and there was quite a lot online uh, suggesting that whilst you were a player, you're qualities even then as a leader um i did read something about you taking charge of player meetings and being a strong leader within the group already um was it ever suggested to you by a manager that you played for that one day you should probably go this route and go into coaching or or management um i think you know when i was made captain at dundee united uh peter houston you know it's funny because when, when people speak to you about these attributes you have sometimes you probably don't see them in yourself you know and it's okay you know I'm quite probably a modest person and you know I think when someone says that about you you probably just think I just being nice to me you know where (laughs) you know yeah where that's just probably a natural characteristics and and you're you know it's probably that you know desire to win and you know as a player I, I I always put you know team goals before personal gain and I always wanted to do well I always wanted to win. I'd rather win, you know, one nil and than get B four three and score a hat trick. You know, so it was, yeah. it was always about the team winning for me, and you know, and how we done that, and how we managed to do that. You know, was you know, it, it was just about making sure everyone was pulling in the right direction. And it, it was probably Peter Houston, and maybe maybe even Craig Levine, if, if I remember correctly, might have said, "Oh, like you know, it might be something. You might be something to start thinking about for when you finish." Because I'd had obviously quite a few serious injuries in my career, um, that you know you, you then you then realise how fragile your career is. I suppose that sure. you know it, it just takes you know one bad tackle or or one you know twist to the knee the wrong way that you know your career can be over before it, it even starts. So it, it probably 
it probably is important to have, you know, something in your mind that you you would like to do. But I've always been very, very focused that that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and there was nothing going to stop that. And, and it's funny because I remember being in school and, you know, the teacher saying, what are you going to do when you leave school? And I just say, I'm going to be a football player. And they kind of laugh at you, just think, yeah, all right, okay, yeah. But <laughs> what are you really yeah. going to do? And and it was genuinely like, no, the, the, that's what I'm going to do. And you just, you kind of had that focus on, on on being that professional footballer and giving everything you had to get there, that when you do finally get there, you probably just want to, you want to stay there as long as you can. So you, you don't really take your eye off what you're doing. And that's kind of what, the way I looked at it. So um, in terms of, yeah, the characteristics that you spoke about, there was one or two managers that, that kind of maybe mentioned that, you know, have a look at maybe going down yeah. this route when you're finished. But again, it's, you just, you just think you're going to play forever, you know, and it's, <laughs> it, it unfortunately does not happen like that. Yeah, of course. Of course. It, was, it, it must be really, like you say, you, you probably look back at it thinking they're, they're just, they're trying to be nice to me and, um, they're just suggesting that to, to boost my confidence, but actually now looking back, they they probably were right. <laughs> yeah, um, no, well, they, they must have been right because because what you've done already um, at your age, I mean, to to coach in a first team as we'll get on to it, um, the age you were, a lot of people ha- have to go a lot lower and, and they slowly sort of progress onto that. But yeah. um, you didn't get the job for no reason. Um, you get that role through being the right man for the job. So um, the characters characteristics must have been there. Um, I'll move on to your first role so we can get yeah. sort of properly talking into your coaching career so far. Um, and yeah. the first role um, was Hearts under 20s coach, uh, I believe yeah. January 2016. Um, yeah. So the first of all, sort of how did that come about? Was it something that was sort of starting to happen as you played and, and did you enjoy it was really the first question. Um, oh, I loved it, yeah. It was it was unbelievable. It really was. Um but yeah, it kind of came about. I had a, I got a phone call from from Craig Levine. Just I was at Raith Rovers at the time playing. Uh, I yeah. went to Raith. Just you know, I spoke recently about this to someone that I kind of went there to I signed a short term deal there with the view to in the January you know looking to go abroad to play for a couple of years just to to experience mm-hmm. something different different and and different cultures etc. And um, so yeah, I, I had kind of that was my kind of plan was to to play. Till the January at rate, and then from then, you know, look or to try and get stuff in place for January to then sure. maybe go abroad somewhere. But yeah. I got a phone call in, I think it was maybe the October time, I think it was from Craig, mm-hmm. just to ask me what my plans were. Um, I actually thought the the Hearts were wanting to sign me as a player when I first seen the call, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately not. Um, so no, so Craig, uh, he just asked me what my, my plans were um, and I kind of explained that to what I was trying to do and, and he just said, look, he said, would you be interested in coming to speak to us about doing the 20s role of Hearts? It's, it's become available. Would you be interested in coming to speak to us? So I went and I met himself and um, Anne Bulge and, and Robbie Nielsen and we had a chat and um, yeah. and, and then they spoke about what, what they were looking for and, and if I would be interested. And, and at the time... I just thought, well, what an opportunity. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's something that I've kind of I've been wanting to do. I had planned to go on my A licence that summer. So I, I hadn't done my A licence at that stage, but I, I was speaking to the SFA about going on it that yeah. summer. Um, so, yeah, so it, it was it was a fantastic opportunity. I think I, I just turned, I was turning 33 in that January. So I knew that, you know, there wasn't many years left to play and I probably had another couple of years left at best. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so it, you know, to be offered that type of role at a, at a club like Hearts, who are arguably probably the third biggest club in Scotland, to work yeah. with their young kids coming through, you know, working with some fantastic young talents, um, yeah. So it, it was it was it was a no brainer really. I had I had maybe a ten minute conversation with my wife about you know the prospect of hanging up our, hanging up the boots and and she loved you know, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, yeah. No, she obviously she used to love going to watch me play. So it was obviously. She obviously just backed my decision, um, yeah. but yeah, so it, it was a fantastic opportunity, and I know, I know, you know how many, you know, people probably were more deserving of the role, and um, probably yeah. as you said there, when you speak about, you know, people's pathways and, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the groundwork they put in. So I, I knew that roles like this don't come about very, very often, 
and I knew sure. that it was a fantastic opportunity to get in to the next stage um, of my career development and, and of my career pathway, you know, at a really, really high level. So yeah. I, I jumped at the chance. Um, but I just obviously wanted to wait until the January to go in. We, we'd kind of spoke in October, so I wanted to try and see up my contract with Wraith. I didn't want to leave them, you know, without a striker um, or one striker down, should I say. Yeah, so, sure. so Hearts were really, really accommodating and they were very, very, um, very, very good in terms of, you know, allowing that and, and holding the job for me um, until the January to allow me to go in and start. Yeah, yeah, and that, that could only really be because they already knew you as a person. I think it comes down to, it, it sounds like it comes down to the level of trust um, they had in you. Obviously, having already known you as a player, um, they get to know you fairly well as a person as well. Um, yeah. So I think they're not just inviting back somebody that they know can either already was or can start to develop into a fantastic coach, um, but somebody that they, they really, really trust um, sort of to take the role. And do you think it was a big part of your decision to do it, the fact you, you almost covered it there, really? Do you think because it was Hearts and because it was people you had worked with before and because of the role that you that you decided not actually, I am going to go and I'm still going to play for another couple of years, which must have been really tempting? Yeah. Um, was it that? Yeah, well, right I, think, I, think, yeah I think so. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on. You know, the, the prospect of playing on for another couple of years, you know, I'd love them to play, and I know people say it all the time, play as long as you can, and and I totally get that. Yeah. But I I, I look at it and I'm 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 quite a realist, and I, you know when I look at you know the amount of full time teams in Scotland, you know there's not there's not many full time teams in Scotland, there's not many full time coaching roles in Scotland, you know out with sure. out with like you know the Premiership, if you know you've got a couple of part time teams in League One, or sorry, in the Championship, you've got maybe I think Wraith were full time last year in, in League One and Falkirk, and then everyone else is is part time. So so I knew that it was a it was a fantastic opportunity to go in, as I said, at, at a at a really really high level, um, yeah. and to work with elite players. And um, so so yeah, it was, and, and as you said about relationships as well. Look, I good played with Robbie Nielsen at Dundee United, who was the manager at the time. Yeah. Craig Veen was my manager um, at Dundee. You know, he was the, he was the manager that brought me to Scotland, and and obviously Anne, I didn't know Anne, but you know when when I met her in that meeting, I got I got a really good vibe off her and good feeling off her. So, um, mm. you know, so you're getting to meet people, and I think I think a lot of football in general and and probably life in general is about re- relationships and and how you work with people. Um, so yeah, so I, I kind of. I, I knew how Craig was. I knew I knew Robbie from from being teammates, um, and yeah, and and as I said, I, I got a good impression off of Anne when I met her. So, um, and then I add that into the fact that it was, as I in my opinion, it was going to to Hearts, who for me are, are, are the biggest club outside of you know uh, Celtic and Rangers. So, yeah. so it was it was it really was um, you know a no brainer just to 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 jump into a role. That you know, as I said, I'd, I'd kind of put some foundations in place by doing my B license, and and I, I had the, my eye on on getting into that. And, and as I said, there was not many opportunities about. So you know, do I play on for another couple of years and then hope that something like this comes up again in the future, or do I just say say, well, right, let's just let's just have a clean cut and and jump straight into it. And that's yeah, and that's kind of what we did, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking, um, especially when you've, like you say, it was the intention was originally to continue to play, and you get all this advice to play as long as you can. Um, how did you mentally deal with finishing that, pushing it to one side, um, and step into coaching? Did you, from the start, was it actually quite easy because you were sort of home again as such in Hearts, um, or was there a period where actually it was it was quite difficult, which you often hear about? No, it, it is tough, like, and you miss like. I think, I think you miss as a player. You, like, it's pro- it's probably a bit different in terms of like I've gone from from playing to straight into coaching, so I still have that, you know, that yeah. routine of um, you know being involved, being in training every day, and and being around the players, and you know you can sure. still have that that banter with the players, etc. And um, but obviously you're a coach, so it's a li- it's slightly different. But you still you still have that element. I think it would have been different if I'd maybe retired. And I'm sure it would have been a lot tougher if I had retired. And then you're going from that to like you know on a Saturday not having a match day or, you know. So I get yeah. it and I, I I totally understand. And 
I can see how how difficult it can be for players that retire and you mm-hmm. know then they, they lose that probably sense of belonging to something. Um but yeah, yeah. I, I think I kinda of looked at it in, in the in the way that, you know, I was still involved, I was still going to watch matches on a Saturday, you know, with the first team. Um and, and, and I probably just enjoyed the fact that, you know, I was waking up on a Sunday and I wasn't like the tin man because I used to wake up on a Sunday, <laughs> black and blue, like the tin man. And, and I, enjoyed, I enjoyed waking up on a Sunday and actually being able to move properly. Um, so, yeah, so, it, it, and, and to be fair, as, as I said, like there was times, there was times when you were with the 20s and, and I'm sure many coaches have this issue when they're probably not at the top of the, the food chain, you know, where you, you have your session planned and, um, you know the manager, the manager or the assistant manager will come in five minutes before your session is about to start and and tell you that they need player X, Y, and Z, and then your session just gets ripped up to pieces. So, you know there was there was a, <laughs> yeah. there was a couple of moments where I actually thought right, I'll just join in the session to keep it keep it the same. So I, I actually then got to train with the players, which I, which to be fair, if I was giving advice to young coaches, I would actually say you know to do that to you know sometimes sometimes join in the session. Um, you know, not all the time, obviously, but I would say, you know, occasionally if you lose a player, yeah. you know, and, and you want to keep the session, sometimes just joining in the session, you can you can teach the players in a different way. And, and I enjoyed that on occasion, you know, just joining in the odd training session with them. And um, mm. and I'd imagine that, you know, I'd like to think they enjoyed that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good. Good. That's, that, that's brilliant. And I'm, I'm sure that those that, that sort of got involved in those sessions and, and those around you would sort of going forward, uh, maybe at the time they they probably don't, especially as an under twenty, they might not realise exactly what they're getting and exactly what they're experiencing. But I'm sure looking back, uh, especially a few years uh, fast forward, um, I'm, I'm very sure they'll look back and and those kind of things will sort of stick in their mind. Um, I know they would have done it if you think about yourself as a player, if if your coach is joining the session, um, still physically able and and sort of teaching you bits bits that way. Um, yeah, that, that that's great. And the uh, I'm going to move on to for anybody that hasn't been to Hearts before the training ground, which will be a massive majority of people listening. Um, well, how is the training ground? What are the facilities like and, and the environment, that kind of thing at a club like that? The facilities are are like second to none. Um, they train mm-hmm. at the the Orium, which is you know the the hub for Scotland. The you know yeah. it's it's a, a Harriet Watt University. You know it's it's n- the only issues you kind of had as a coach is it's not Hart's facility; it's the, they rent the facility. So, but okay. it, but to have to have your own base, you know, um, was great because you know, as good as that, yeah, yeah, it was it was really 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 like different class, you know, big in Laura. But again, it's you know you had Scotland rugby used to train there, so sometimes if you know if the pitches were were. Uh, frozen off you had to negotiate times to get on the astro but in terms of like when when the weather is good and you know and, and you have the pitches that you you've been allocated the, the pitches are great the facilities you know has a, a top quality gym uh high performance gym it has you know the hydro pools wow. uh, so it, it's it really is you know it's it's a top-notch facility um you know and i'd, I'd say probably you know, when I was at Rangers, Rangers facility was excellent. Um, Murray Parking is called the Hummel Training Centre now, but that was mm-hmm. second to none. No, Celtic have have a really good one. I know Aberdeen now have just opened up their their training complex. So there's, there's not many there's not many football clubs in Scotland that have probably a facility like that at their disposal. And you know, it, I think it, it it really helped when you're looking to sign players or if players were coming up to you know to look around the training facility and then. You know, looking around the actual stadium as well with the new stand and you know the, the stadium. Uh, if if you haven't been or if people, have, it's a, mm-hmm. a fantastic stadium. Like and it's, it was probably as a player my favourite away venue, and um, just wow. because of the the atmosphere, like the the stands feel like they're right on top of the pitch. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm not just saying that because I was at Hearts, but I genuinely, um, I remember saying that when I was a player at Dundee United, I used to love playing at at Tyne Castle. Um. Just, just for the sheer atmosphere that was there, so yeah, so so the whole cl- the club as a whole is is a fantastic club, and it's you know for players to improve and to get better, they have everything that is there at their disposal to to get better, you know, to to come into a club and you know to have all all these facilities and you know 
to make yourself better. And, and that's that's what I think as a player, if you're going into a club and you see you see these facilities and you just think, you know, yeah. if, if I don't get better, yeah, it's an attraction. But I think, you know, you have to take that respons- responsibility upon yourself to 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 use them and to to make sure that when you you do leave the club you you are leaving it a better player. Definitely, definitely, that's great advice as well for for the players listening uh, into the podcast. Um, I'm going to go sort of back to your playing career um, just to touch on it and still keep it relevant to what we're talking about now. Um, what, what do you think it was from your playing career um, that sort of affected what you wanted to be as a coach? Do you think it was just always your own personality and how you how you were yourself or do you think there was sort of either coaches you worked with or things people done that you thought that you think now actually probably sort of encased into you and what you are as a coach do you think those experiences sort of sculpted you now um i think i think one thing is like every every person i've worked on every manager every coach everybody's different and and every yeah. everybody like I, I firmly believe that you can you can learn something from everyone um, you know, you can even if that's just one bit of information, or or if it's numerous bits of information. I do believe that you can tap into the knowledge of everyone and and take away at least one thing. And you know, having worked mm-hmm. with a lot of of really good coaches and managers, I, I, f- I feel myself very fortunate that you know you can you can try and call on that. Now, mm-hmm. what this is where I, I think football is is fascinating, and I think it's 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 great that you know what I think and what I perceive to be really good. You know, you might think is rubbish. You know, so so I think it, it's all about yeah. opinions, and it's all about you know, you know, you having that opinion and you having that belief in your opinion, and mm-hmm. and and sticking to it. You know, because you know those sessions that I used used to do as a player that I used to love doing, and you'd look at like the player that was beside you, and and he'd have the the hump because he didn't like doing that session. So, yeah. so it. One thing I did learn is that you're not going to please everyone, you know, but I think as as a coach or as a manager, as long as you feel that you've got the work in that you've needed to get done, that you feel comfortable going into the game and you feel like the team is ready and you feel like you've got your message across, I think that's the most important thing, you know. I think it's, Definitely. you know, I think it's uh, one thing I think is massive and I think sometimes gets overlooked is, you know, we can talk about tactical stuff and you can talk about technical, but I think, if players aren't enjoying coming to work and they're not enjoying what they do, they're not going to, you know, fulfil their potential. They're not going to reach the potential. So I think making the environment an enjoyable one. Now, I don't mean by just making it enjoyable, just you know, you know, having having a laugh and a joke. But what I mean is like putting on stuff that that the players actually feel this is going to make me better, and and I feel you know they they actually enjoy doing it. And and you can see when they're coming in the mornings the they're coming in thinking what are we what are we doing today or and I used to be like that as a player. I used to love coming in and, and wondering what you were gonna do and um and looking forward to it, I suppose. And I think as I said, if you're enjoying yourself um in your workplace then I don't think you'll go far wrong. Mm-hmm, definitely. And with the role being under twenties coach, um and the mm-hmm. nature of the role, um two questions on it really. Um was there much uh, emphasis on you needing to win games of football? I'm really interested in that. And Mm -hmm. as part of coaching that age group, what do you think is important for a coach to have or um, sort of the environment to create when you are working with an under-20 side? So I want to make it quite particular to to that role. So did winning matter um, to the club? And yeah. Yeah, so so it's funny because the winning, the the club weren't interested, you know, if you won. Um, yeah. Or if you, you know, obviously, I think the winning side of it comes down to probably personal pride and you know wanting to win, and and even with the players, like, you know, we we were very much, you know, under the the guidelines of, you know, if someone's old enough, you know, they're, they're good enough, they're old enough. So you know, we had boys playing in our under twenties team that were like maybe fifteen, sixteen years of age. So right. you know, you're you're putting them up against, you know, potentially, you know. A first team player who's playing down, you know, to get because effectively it's your reserves. So yeah. you might have a first team player who's played two hundred games and who's playing against a fifteen or sixteen year old kid. So well, you know yeah. the result. The result for us wasn't wasn't the end goal. It was more about giving players and exposing players to situations that challenged them. You know, and and even when you looked at 
you know, even down the academy. Like if we had, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, you had like uh, Connor Smith, for instance, who was, you know, maybe say under fourteens or under thirteens at the time. If he was, if he was too good for his age, they would play him up a year or they play him up two years to to challenge him. Um, mm-hmm. So it wasn't about the players being really, really good at their own age group. It was about testing them and pushing them to see can they do it at the next age group and and really, you know, putting them in positions where they're going to learn, you know, because we're, as I said, we're playing boys at 15, 16 and doing their 20s and, you know, physically we know they can't handle it, but, you know, it maybe makes them move the ball a bit quicker because if they get into a physical battle with someone who's physically stronger, they're not going to win it. So they then have to think of ways and they have to come up with ways to, to work out the situation they're in and I think it really really helped a lot of the younger players and, and and as I said you know early on you know when I was in it it was tough because you know you have that winning mentality and you have that you know that sure. desire to win games yourself it was hard yeah. to get my head around oh we're not we're getting beat or you're coming and you're a bit you know you have to get maybe beat you know three or four one you're a bit like oh we're being battered there but you know it was great because you know, Robbie and Stevie Crawford and, and Craig used to come to all the games and they'd, they'd come in and be really positive with you and be like, oh, no, the, the boys played really well and, you know, such and such done well. And 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 then it then, you know, made you, you know, probably sit back and, and actually think about, right, this role, I'm not I'm not here to win the under-20s league. I'm not here to win the, the cup. I'm here to try and help push these players on as much as we can. And, and and if two or three of them get into the first team, that's my role and that's my job. And I think it was it was understanding the role um, and understanding that, that you're right, winning, you know, I think we can put a lot of importance on winning um, at a young age. But I do, I personally think that when they get to under 20s, they then need to start to learn to win because the next stage is first team football. You know, and I think that's, you know, you can't, you can't go into first team football with the mentality that winning isn't important because it, it, effectively it is. If you don't win enough games as a first team manager, you, you lose your job. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I think I think in terms of the role at the start, I, I was I was kind of big on right. Oh, we need to win the game, and then I effectively understood the role that you know it's 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 not about that. But I still wanted to have that element of you know you know you might be winning the game two one. And then you you maybe lose three two or draw two two, and you could maybe focus on, you know, you could maybe do your video on right. Let's talk about how how we can start to see games out. You know, yes, the winning's not important, but but we have to have that element of we need to we need to understand that you know the next stage we're going to and the next level you're going to step up to, it becomes a, it becomes um, an important factor. So you have to you have to start to implement that but I think the most important thing is 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 trying to develop them as players and and you know getting them ready ready mentally and um and, and 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 physically you know I think a lot of the time as I said you know you've got younger kids who physically probably aren't ready and you need to try and give them that time and you know th- you're doing individual training plans and you know it might be that you have someone who who is technically excellent but physically they're not up to it. So they might have to do, mm-hmm. you know, an extra couple of gym sessions a week or, you know, yeah. so, so yeah, it is very much about, you know, trying to find out the strengths and weaknesses of each player and trying to work on them, you know, not just the weaknesses. You're obviously working on strengths as well to try and improve them and make them as to the best they can be. Um, sure. And, and just, as I said, just getting them ready for that next step, which is, which is ultimately first team football. Definitely. Definitely. So it's really about finding that balance between, Definitely needing to learn to win for sure, because if the next step is first team football, then they're going to be <laughs> that, that's going to be a huge jump in environment if they're not used to um, a little bit of expectations in terms of standards. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also good to know that when you are playing the 15s and 16 year olds in there, that actually the club um, do realise this is a development side, and it, that is what but it's that, about. That, 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 yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's where like you know I I have to you know. I think if you're going into a role like that, you need to understand as the coach what the expectations are of the club, like because because not every club will have the same expectations of Hearts. You know, some clubs yeah. might, you know, some clubs might might they're you know they might have the the remit that you need to go and win, you know, ninety percent of your games or or whatever it is. So yeah. so I think you need to understand 
the because you might go in as the coach with the the mindset of you want to develop the players, but the club might be only interested in winning. So it's it's finding the right balance, and it is it is trying to trying to work out what the club want and what yeah. the, what they're at. Um, and as I said, that, that's where I found like it was really good working for for Robbie and Craig and and, and working with Stevie Stevie Crawford, um, who's now the Dunfermline manager. You know, just it was great working with them guys. Um, you know, and, and they were very very supportive. Um, and they understood they probably, you know, as a young coach, they were a young coach themselves. They understood, you know, my mindset of, you know, you probably in my head, I'm thinking, oh, we need to win. But they they were really, really good in, in, in terms of like, you know, supporting you and saying, look, the result doesn't matter. You know, it's about it's about you trying to get players through or helping get players through um, as yeah. many and as often as you can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, that's good. Now you've mentioned Robbie Nielsen in there, and obviously he's been a bit of a theme throughout, being so so influential in in bringing you in there and having that relationship from prehand. So I'm going to move on to the fact that I've got here August 2017. Um, I've got that he was sacked. I don't know whether that was a mutual thing or he was dismissed from the role. And and you're asked to take the job as interim manager. Um, so how was the experience for you in terms of what by that time it had been a friend of yours losing their job um, so, and yourself taking the role? Yeah, no, Rob, Robbie's one actually, he, he moved on to MK Dons, um, I think in the, the November, I think it was, or, or something like that. So he, he moved on, he actually, he actually moved on to MK Dons. Um, so, so it was, that one, that one was you know, because I've done the role twice, so I've done it under Robbie yeah. um, when he moved to MK Dons, and then uh, when he yeah. when Ian Ian got sacked, yeah, so I took over then. So the first time, like, because the club was obviously in a really really good place, and the team I think were maybe second in the league at the time, so they were flying high in the league. They were they were playing really well. There wasn't an awful lot you really had to do, to be honest. <laughs> like Robbie, Robbie left, I think after the Rangers game, which was midweek, and then I think. On the tours, they maybe left, and then on the Friday we came in and we got asked to take over myself and Andy Cork got asked to take over the team for the Ross County game. So it was basically yeah. just you know copy and paste. If I'm being honest, like the team was flying high, they were doing really well. They hadn't, there was no need to change anything. So yeah. it was just a, a case of steering the ship, keeping it going, and, and we we went to Ross County and uh, we we got a two two draw. I think Jamie Walker. You missed a penalty in the last minute to win the game oh. for us. Um, so I've, Difficult. I've never forgiven him. <laughs> never. <laughs> but um, no. So it, it, as I said, it wasn't an awful lot to do. Now, obviously, then when you're asked in the in the next situation, when the team isn't doing so well, it's hard. Eh? Again, it is. It's difficult. And uh, again, you know, managers losing their job. It's it's never never nice. You know, it's not nice to see people lose their jobs. And you know. Right. You, you have you have empathy for them that they're you know you, you feel for them and um so yeah but so to be asked to step in in that situation was tough and it, it was challenging but it was something that I really enjoyed in terms of you know being given the opportunity to to do it and I think I was there for maybe three or four weeks um, I took four games which which was great for for my own um development and you know seeing the deal and how the, how club works from the inside and as as you know an interior manager you know, gave me a great insight. And actually, you know, again, you talk about you know, giving you the bug for something that gave me the bug, then that, you know, I thought I'd love to that's be a manager. Yeah, and yeah. that's the environment I want to work in. And, and I want to be, I want to be a manager in my own right one day, you know, down the line, whether that's, you know, wh- whenever that may be. And it certainly has, you know, given me that focus on, on getting there, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that was really where I, when I mentioned previously about people suggesting um, sort of your suitability to go into management and coaching and um, they look back at yourself as a player, that was really on, in the article I read, to be honest. Um, it was at this time because there was a lot a lot of people and there were quote marks from this coach and that coach and the supporters group and, and a good number of people that actually at that time you may or may not have been aware, I think really wanted you to get the role, get to get the job. Oh, yeah. That was I could find that all, all over the internet of, of people wanting you at that time to to be given the opportunity to take the role. Was that was that ever on the cards at that time or, or really or really not ever discussed? I, I wasn't really discussed to be honest. It was kind of just, you know, I'd been asked to step into the role and um, while yeah. the club did their due diligence on, on other uh, candidates and they looked about and 
Um, so yeah, I, I just kind of, I just done the role to the best of my ability in that time. It was obviously, as I said, it was a difficult period. You know, the new stand was just being built, so yeah, uh, we we hadn't we didn't have any home games. All the games were were away from home, so we played Celtic oh, wow. away, we played Kilmarnock away, Rangers sure. away, Motherwell away. Yeah. So like, and oh. and you yeah. know, in recent Deep years. End. Yeah, in recent years, then in that time, they were the four toughest venues that you could go to as as the Hearts team. So it was it was tough. It, it, it was I'm not gonna lie, but it was something that I really enjoyed. You know, I enjoyed you know even the little things like dealing with the media. You know, every week I enjoyed little things like that. You know, so enjoyed yeah. you know sitting with your coaches and trying to come up with game plans and trying to come up with strategies that you know could maybe get you get you points at the weekend and. You know, so it it was really enjoyable, and as I said, it was it was definitely a learning curve for me. So, um, so yeah, was it was I ever in with a chance again? I don't know. Um, again, I, I wasn't something. You know, one thing I, I kind of taken with me as from my playing days was I didn't really read an awful lot of press or, you know, no. other people because I think you know if you go looking for positivity, there's a very very good chance you're going to find negativity, and that that can affect you. Um, a yeah. lot more than the positive articles can. So, um, so I, I tried to stay clear from from all that was going on and on the internet, as you say, and and in the press. So I just kind of focused on our our day to day workings and and our dealings, and just tried yeah. to to get the team in the best uh, frame of mind going into the games of the weekend as we could. Mm-hmm. Sure, and I, I think that's a perfect time to to lead into your next role. Um, so it was your first role as, as a first team coach. Um, uh-huh. And I really want to talk about, because you've just mentioned it, it was the fir- your first taste of, like, a, a, it's a must-win environment, let's be honest. Um, when you're at yeah. first team level, different people want to do it in different ways. Some some want to do it and play through the thirds, and, and that's the way they want to play, and, and some don't. And that's, there's not a right or wrong, but both teams are, t- are trying to win. So yeah. how was it? How was your first experience in that must-win environment? I uh, know again it was like you know I, I really enjoyed it you know and again it's you know you're at a club where you're working with with top players and you're working with with players that you know are are are, are very good at what they do and you know a lot of them you know a lot of the players when they get to that level they know what they're about they know you know what they can and can't do and yeah and you're obviously it's it's different because you know you're you're just facilitating I suppose what the manager wants, and you know you're trying to get that message and message across um, as best you can to the players, um, and you know you're you're just basically sounding out what the manager wants, as I said, and it was it was really really good. Eh? I really enjoyed it, and you know to work to work alongside. I was in the role alongside um, Liam Fox, who who I became really really good friends with, and you know I think I think we we bounced off each other really really well, and um, yeah. you know and I think the manager. The manager was was excellent in terms of you know he he kind of you know let you let you take your sessions and he would step in when he felt he needed to step in and mm-hmm. um no so it was it was a good again just a good learning experience and you know yeah I, I still as a young coach you're going to make mistakes and it's you know at that at that level when you make mistakes the players let you know about it you know whereas at under twenties <laughs> level. You know, you maybe make a mistake and they won't say anything to you. But at first team level, you make a mistake, they don't let you live it down for a few weeks. So, yeah. um, but it, it is a test. It's a test of character as well, I suppose, because you know you're working with some, as I said, some top players, some international players there as well that you're working with, and you know you, you need to be you need to be capable and you need to be you know have that um, you know the characteristics that you know you're going to get challenged. You know, players, as I said, they're going to challenge you, and you need to. You need to have an understanding that again we spoke about earlier everybody is different and everybody learns differently and everybody you know takes on information differently so it's trying to as the coach you're trying to work out how you can get that me- the manager's message across to the different players in different ways and you know to make sure that they all have that clear understanding of what the manager wants so you know it, it has been you know uh you know from being chucked in at the deep end with the 20s you know to to there it was it was really, really, you know, enjoyable, and it's it's something that I'm very, very thankful to Hearts, you know, for obviously the opportunities to to do, and um, I feel mm-hmm. I've come away from a, a better, a better coach and, and a better person. So definitely, um, and I've got here that it was Craig Levine you were working under at the time um, mm-hmm. in terms of being manager. 
Um, so it's, it's of course it's up to you how how much you want to go into the the playing style. But how was he as a person to work under? Firstly, because um, I think that's really important the characteristics characteristics of of a top manager. Um, and, and how was you trying to play? What was the style of play? How did the team look to watch? So yeah, so like, I think it, I think Craig probably gets a lot of stick for it for his style of football. Um, but obviously, I, I've I've played as a player under him, and, and he was quite successful. And I think I think you know he he generally knows what works in Scotland, and you know he he wants to play a style where the ball you know goes wide and it comes in the box and. You know, midfielder up on the edge of the box for anything that gets comes out. It either gets recycled back wide again and comes back in the box, or it comes out and they have a have a dig a goal. And you know, mm-hmm. he wants his defenders to be you know aggressive and and marking on the front foot. And you know, so I think you know when you look at the squad that he had built, I suppose, um, in that first year or so, like. You know, I, I think a lot of people, and I feel sorry for him in a way that you know he had a he had. A horrendous run of injuries, you know. I think, you know, and I think a lot of people probably, you know, will look at it and think, ah, oh, it's just an excuse. And and I can see why they would say that. But you know, yeah. when when he had that fully fit squad together, playing the way he wanted them play to play, um, yeah, they were they were flying high. I think in October they were top of the league. You know, wow. I'm not sitting here telling you they were going to go on and win the league because to do that, you know, against Rangers Celtic over the course of a season, you know, it has to be a remarkable season that you put in. And but yeah. the start of that campaign, the boys were flying; they were really taking on what you wanted to do. And um, and yeah, so like, and then and then what happened is you, you obviously get a couple of injuries. You lose Stephen Naismith, who's your talisman. You lose John Suter, who's your who's your centre back. You know, your ball playing centre back, um, who then gets injured with an Achilles injury. And then you lose. I, I'm sure there was maybe two or three other more. I think UGP who got injured at the time, and he was he was flying. So there was maybe four or five players um, that were maybe the first four or five names on the team sheet that got got you know I wouldn't oh, even wow. say short term injuries, there were long term injuries. So then you know it totally puts the strain on the rest of the squad, and and that's probably where Close. that's probably where I think you know the team went wrong. We probably didn't have the right strength and depth um, in in the squad. Um, mm. I think when you look back and, and you reflect on these these situations, you know that's probably where could have done could have done probably more. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed working with Craig. As as I said earlier, he was he was great in terms of like you know he he, he let you do your job. He let you get on with it, and you know if he felt that he needed to, to I suppose give you guidance, he would give you guidance. You know, he would give you praise when he felt you needed praise, and I thought his, his man management was was really really good. Um, mm-hmm. And and as I said, his style, you know, isn't for everyone. I think because you know you look at, you know, you can now watch a game anywhere in the world. You know, and I think, you know, you, every Saturday night you can sit and watch. Well, you used to be able before this. Before <laughs> this you could sit and watch. You know, Barcelona. You could sit and watch Real Madrid, and it's very very easy to compare your own team to the teams that you're watching on TV. And I think, you know, it's probably, look, is is it a bit unfair? Probably, but it's that's that's the way Craig wanted to set his teams up. And, you know, and he, and he, he recruited players to to play the way he wanted to play. And um, and as I said, it was successful for a period um, until the, the, the squad got decimated. Yeah, yeah. That's, I can remember the period actually well. I can remember seeing Hearts up there and, uh, and like you say, over the course of a season, um, in terms of expectations in the league, you're definitely looking at the top two um, without any disrespect to anybody else in there. Um, and anybody listening will understand. You you just expect to see Celtic and Rangers at the top um, and then to keep looking at the league. And I, and I remember I, I try and check as much as I can. Um, and I remember checking and, and Hearts are still there and they're still there and you, they were there and thereabouts for a long while. So... So he must have, and you as a group as well, because I've spoke to so many coaches now that have mentioned the importance of the backroom staff. So he, he certainly didn't do that alone. Uh, it was people like yourself in the group that achieved it. Um, yeah, that, that don't get me don't get me wrong. Like that's not me saying like you're going into the work and you're saying, <laughs> you know, oh, we're not going to win the league, lads. Like obviously, <laughs> you know, you're you're just trying to take it one game at a time, and and look at. You know, you look at Leicester a few years ago. You know, to go and win the league, like it's it's something that happens. You know, happen. it can yeah. happen and it will happen again, and there's no doubt it'll happen again. So yeah. you, you have to have that belief you can do it. But 
you know, I think for me, you just don't go around shouting from the rooftops that you're going to do it. You know, I think you've got to be quite, quietly confident about your, what you're doing. And, and especially when you get in that position, you, you need to just take it in, in small segments. So that's my belief on it is take it in small segments, concentrate on your next game, try and do the best you can in that game and, you know, and then see where it takes you. And um, as sure. I said, unfortunately, unfortunately, it just wasn't to be that year in terms of, you know, some serious, serious injuries to, to key players. Yeah, definitely. Um, you, we mentioned the environment and, of course, as coaches, um, we always talk about uh, a winning environment and an elite environment, a togetherness. How is it at a club uh, as big as that? Um, especially, obviously, being your first role with a first team uh, as a coach. Um, how is it, what kind of things do you do to create, I, I want to say, to create a togetherness and also make it an elite environment for players? What kind of things can you do? Um, that's a good question. I think... You know, I think the big thing is like it's about how you treat people, and it's about you know making probably players feel part of the process. So, for instance, as a coach, like you know, I would, you know, if I'm doing video analysis with a group of players, I'm doing it with an individual player. You know, yeah. it's not a case of me sitting there, you know, dictating to the player. This is this is what you do. This it's it's you know it's making them feel part of that process and 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 you know letting them have an input and you know I think mm-hmm. you know letting them have have that buy in where they you know they feel like they have actually decisions and and they can make decisions you know so i think you know it can be very easy to 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 tell players you know you must do this you must do that but you know sometimes asking their opinion and you know asking what they think and you know one thing that i know i know robbie had had in previously and the manager had kind of kept on was like a you know a core group of kind of senior players that you know, um, you know, he would sit down with and he would speak to and he would, you know, discuss things and discuss why he's doing certain things. And, you know, it's something that, you know, made me think like, because you, you don't normally think probably let players have that much of an input. And I wouldn't say yeah. it had maybe massive input in maybe the big decisions, but, you know, letting them have little, little areas where they can, they control sometimes letting, you know, if you're sitting down with the strikers, you know, letting one of the strikers, actually deliver the video or, or stuff like that you know just to just to yeah. challenge them and then you know to make them feel as i said part of the process i think that's that's a big part of it mm-hmm. and that core group of players you talk about um that's been set by a manager i, I think sometimes that maybe forms itself a little bit it's, it's probably a self-explanatory group um you've probably got a, a big leader in there in terms of personality and and maybe a senior head as well and i think that forms itself whatever club you're at as such um, mm-hmm. But it's nice, nice to know that maybe the manager uh, in this case picked. Th- these are a few that are going to do different bits for me. Um, I think it shows respect from the players for what the manager is because they don't have to agree to. They don't have to agree to do an extra. Um, but of course they did and they wanted to. Um, and the social side of the game. So in terms of creating a togetherness, do you think it's important they spend that time together away from football? And, and is that dictated by a coach or manager, or is it? a player-led thing how do, how do you sort of influence that yeah it's again that's like i think when i go back to when i was a player like as when i was a captain i tried to make sure everyone felt part of the group yeah. um so i think it, it can be difficult probably as a coach um to you know because there you know people there's going to be clashes of personality and there's going to be people that you know for whatever reason don't get on you know, so you know, put making them and forcing them to, to you know, do things together can can probably sometimes be to the detriment of the group. So I think it's you know, mm-hmm. without without having cliques and without having, um, you know, little breakaway groups, it, it is important to try and you know keep everyone again, as I said, making everyone feel part of the group and you know having having little things like you know there was a couple of occasions where you would maybe go. You know, as a group, you go go kart, and or you'd maybe go for a meal, or you know, that or I know that sometimes the boys would would you know, I think Big Christoph was the captain, so he would he would maybe organise you know social events together, and you know maybe go around and watch the Champions League in, in someone's house or or something like that. So yeah, so yeah, so there's loads you can do, and I think I do think it is important. I think you know team spirit is massive. I think it can it can it can help you out in difficult times. Um, having that team spirit and I think you know if you don't have a good team spirit I think when when you know things go 
a bit pear shaped and a bit wrong. I think you can then see, you know, the the teams that have that, you know, togetherness and that teams that don't have it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I hear from so many, and, and obviously myself as a, as a manager and a coach, I certainly from experience, the more to, more of that you have, I, I don't think it's a, there's a limit to it, but I, th- I think the more you have of it and the more you can try and influence it and maybe drip feed bits of it here or suggest to your captain to, um, to have you done enough together, I think the more clubs do with that, I certainly think by the end of a season you've got a few points because of it. <laughs> yeah, no. I think if you're if you're one one with five minutes to go, you're playing for the manager and you're playing for yourselves. But if you're if you're looking at your teammate by your side and and you want to do it for each other, I I I think yourself as a player will probably give me a better insight. But if you can look at each other and you want to do it for each other, that that must add something a little bit special. Yeah, no, I think it does. I think you know. <laughs> And I think sometimes it's 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 getting that late goal or it's 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 getting you know a late equaliser or a late winner that sometimes gives you that belief that you 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 can do it and um yeah so it does it does when you have that extra bit of team spirit I suppose it does it does help you along the way and um and you you, you can implement that into your training by by different you know making different rules or or different types of games or. You know whether it's you know little sprints, sprints at the start of training that you know lose our sings, little little things that you know have that yeah. camaraderie and you know, <laughs> so that's kind of ways you can probably implement that as a coach and you know without mm-hmm. actually you know telling them to go out on the piss for you know which obviously <laughs> yeah, you know that's the way you kind of would have done it maybe 15, 20 years ago or when I would have started playing you would all just go out and annoy you out but obviously it's changed you know uh, a lot since then so. Um, so yeah, it, it is it is important, and I think you know you've touched on it there. It can it can definitely help you uh, throughout the course of a season. Mm-hmm. Sure. I'm going to go move on to something I found yesterday, um, which uh, and I hope you're willing to talk a little bit about it. I'm sure you will. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the media attention and maybe I want to say almost abuse on players and coaches. Um, I read that you received so much abuse um, for your Catholic um, background whilst you're at Rangers in terms of letters and messages. Um, I just want to know how that, how that was as a player. Um, if you had any support in helping you dealing with it and sort of how you were personally around that time. Yeah, I think one thing I've kind of developed over the years is, is a really, really thick skin, you know, and it's like, it's basically impenetrable. It, it's like, I, mm-hmm. I've quite... My wife says it to me all the time that like, you know, I have no emotions, you know, and I think that comes from, I think that comes from, from being a player and being, you know, probably exposed to, to situations and, and scenarios that, you know, you wouldn't expect any other human being to face. Now, yeah, I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not looking for someone, for people to think, oh, poor John or, or whatever. But, you know, you know, if, if someone has a bad day at the office, it, it doesn't give people the right to, in my opinion, to, you know, to really, really go to town on them, you know, because if, if, if I got someone out to fix my sink and it didn't, if they didn't fix it properly, I'm not going to ring them up and I'm not going to call them every name under the sun. I'm just going to tell them, look, that job wasn't done properly. Can you come out and fix it? Now, Definitely. on that, on the flip side of that, I get that supporters pay really, really good money to go and watch the game. And I get, I get all that, and I just think sometimes we can get caught up, um, you know, again with that will to win, and and you know, and I think sometimes it, it, it can be perceived, you know, the players not trying hard, but I, I don't, I don't look at anybody that walks onto that football pitch that thinks they don't want to do well or they don't want to win. Everyone wants to go on, play as well as they can, and and sometimes you don't. Um, you know when it's when it gets when it gets personal and it gets you know for for reasons out with football, um yeah it can be tough. Um but look, again I, I kind of just I see when you talk about like the letters that I received and and, and the abuse you received, mm-hmm. like one thing is like I'm I'm not a religious person at all. Not a, I'm genuinely not a religious person, and. You know, to be getting abuse for my religion, I actually found that quite comical and I found that quite funny <laughs> because, you know, I genuinely like, again, I'm, 
I'm not, as I said, I'm not a, a, a devoted Catholic, and, and if someone is, then, then fair play, that's their beliefs, but I genuinely wasn't, and, and to be getting stick about that, I just, as I said, I found it quite funny, and, and, and I found it quite, you know, I actually just thought, you know, I, I felt sorry for the people that actually wrote the letters and, and spent the time to call me every name under the sun and, you know, <laughs> to write these letters that I felt sorry for them that actually they felt that strongly and had that them views um, about something like that because I think that's probably what's wrong with the world that, you know, if, you know, people people want to believe in what they want to believe in. That's That's fine. I don't think we should be falling out over things like that, you know. Yeah, sure, and that, that 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 does definitely take a strength. Like you say, you've either were born, we've all developed um, a thick skin to be able to deal with it, and um, and you do hear of more and more support now from clubs in dealing with things like that in terms of yeah. training as a youngster. And for example, anybody coached by you now, they they're, they're going to have a real shoulder to lean on because you've experienced 100%. it from like 100%. the worst end, and you can sort of help that rub off now and and sort of offer that advice because not everyone's going to be a thick skin. Um, no, they are but, a little bit different, but. Uh, I do think, you know, over recent years, you've, you've seen, you know, it's been highlighted a lot more, you know, mental health and, you know, so mm-hmm. there, ha- there has probably been, you know, the stigma around mental health now, I think, has probably, you know, been washed away. And I think it's, you know, players and, and people in general probably feel that it's OK to speak out about these things. And I think, you know, I think that's brilliant that, you know, that that's been taken away. And if people have issues, they can air, the, air their issues. And, and that's not me saying that. I didn't feel like I had that support or I didn't have that network. Of, co- of course I did. Like I would pick up the phone to my dad when he was back then, when he was alive and I'd speak to him about it. And, you know, he, he just, he'd give you advice and I speak to my wife about it. But, you know, ultimately it comes down to, you know, are you going to let the opinions of someone else affect your performance or are you going to, you know, let it affect, you know, your day, I suppose. And, and, and I just thought, I'm not going to give these people the time of day. I'm not going to let them have that room inside my head. And, you know, because it can just eat away at you. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. as I, and as you said there, not everybody is, is like that. Not everybody can deal with it like that. But I, I was probably quite fortunate in a way that, you know, I'd, I'd kind of been exposed to stuff at a very young age. Um, not a very young age. I mean, when I went, probably when I left home at 15 to, to, to go to Stockport County. Um, yeah. you know you kind of you kind of have to grow up very very quickly and uh, and stand on your own two feet and I think that helped me develop yeah. probably that that rhino skin I suppose to to just block everything out yeah yeah definitely um I'm gonna mention you played under so many different coaches um that would have all had different skill sets and different strengths um i don't think we necessarily need to mention the weaknesses of some of them but they will all have a different um area that they're particularly strong in um so i just Mm -hmm. want you to to briefly uh, i know at danger of leaving somebody out who were some of the sort of biggest influences as coaches um and just a little bit on why so what it was about particular people and i must admit there is one i'm particularly interested in having seen ali mccoy that ranges for two years of your three year spell there yeah yeah so again you're right you're, you're you're spot on in terms of like they all have you know different attributes and and you know like for instance like when i was at i first went to stockport county like i went under gary megson now i didn't i didn't play under gary um but you know, you'd be in the odd training session with him and you could see yeah. he had this, you know, real, you know, he was, had a real authority about him and, you know, his attention to detail was excellent. And, um, you know, and then you could, I think then when you look, you go, to, you had a few more, like Sammy McElroy was there and, you know, um, who yeah. else was there? Um, Chris Turner was probably the last manager, I think, that I was there. So I wasn't on Chris very long. So I didn't really get... Um, to know Chris very well or to, to, to see what he was about. But he obviously had a good career as a manager and as a coach. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I think, you know, probably the biggest influence is, you know, probably, you know, Craig Levine, Peter Houston and, and probably Ali. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, Craig, Craig had, uh, again, you know, speaking about Gary Megson having that authority, like Craig, Craig was, you know, was a, was a presence and, um, you know, if you walked into a room, people would stop talking, you know, because he would, was, he would put the fear of God in you, I suppose, as a player. And, and <laughs> you know, you would, yeah, you would be afraid of, of probably that, 
that backlash. But in terms of his his, his coaching, um, you know, his his detail and his you know his match prep and you know was really 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 good. And you know, it, it's something that you know talking about like what you take from it, like the eleven v eleven preparation. Um, that we used to do with Dundee United, you know, was was really good and the detail. Like, and I'm sure most clubs do it, and I know most clubs do it. But you know, where you play your starting eleven against the the reserves or the non-starting eleven or the boys that aren't starting, should I say? And 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 he, he used to just make them play the way he he foreseen the the opposition play, and and it used to pose give you give you I suppose um, the, some of the problems and. Some of the the scenarios that you've come up against either the mm-hmm. following day or the day after, so it, it was it was really good. And and the video analysis you would do on a Monday or a Tuesday after the game was always very detailed, and you always felt like you were getting better. Um, and obviously at the time his assistant Peter Houston, who then became the manager, who then obviously led us to win the Scottish Cup. You know Peter was really really good, and you know as an assistant he was very good. You know in terms of you know mixing with the group and making sure you know you you were doing what you needed to do in terms of on the training pitch and if there was any extra stuff you need to do we would do it with you and you know very very good you know uh one-to-one and and man management and then Ali Ali you know I've I've probably told the story millions times people but (laughs) you know he's he I just I just loved Ali Uh, you know I thought he was great and they took the year I think it was in the build, the run up to winning the cup when we knocked Rangers out, you know the fact that he he just had the humility to wait for maybe fifteen twenty minutes after the game to shake all our hands after we come off celebrating and and to wish us luck going forward and you you, you kind of got the genu like a uh, the feeling that he, he genuinely meant you know he, he genuinely meant it and, yeah. and and it just it made me just realise that you know like you know it's great when you win but you have to have that element of you know, you know, when you get beat, you still have to, you still have to have that element, and and it's something that I then have taken into my coaching, for instance, like in terms of, you know, on a Saturday, if if when I was at Hearts, if we got beat, you know, I would wait and I would I would shake the opposition's hand, all the players coming off the pitch. I just felt, you know, it's it, both teams have tried their best, and if they have beat you on the day, then you know, obviously you're not happy, but you know, you you have to congratulate the opponent and. That's something that I've I've kind of you know always remembered, and when I got the chance to obviously then go and play for him, you know I, I wanted to jump at the chance because it was that was mm-hmm. in my mind, you know when um, when when I heard that, that he wanted to sign me, I thought that, you know I have to go and meet him, I have to speak to him about going there, and um, you know and and he's just a really really good guy, and you know and and a good a good really good at man management, good you know. As I'm sure you, you, you hear him on talk sport, you see him on question sport. He's just yeah. a really, really good character, and you know, someone you know that you wanted to do well for, and there's someone that you would you would run through a brick wall for, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that's key. Um, and I think what's really interesting is hearing you go back, um, and it excited you signing for Rangers and signing for Ali McCoyce, um, somebody that you had not played under before. You'd never experienced his coaching, but it was just that personality and the way he had been, it, just his presence, like you said, in terms of congratulating the other team on their success. And he was just a person that, despite yeah. his football success, it was actually the person as well that, as well as being a massive football club, you, you sort of looked at and thought, I'm, I'm quite attracted towards signing for that. Yeah, I think you know, and then obviously then when you get to know him and you know you get you get to you know you get to meet him, you get to work with him, you know you you see just it's what you see is what you get, and I and I really like that. He's just the authentic. He's just really really genuine, um, and you can see that he just wants the team and and the individuals to do well, and um, and I've got a lot of time for that, and you know he's someone that. You know, I really enjoyed working under and, and and a person that you know I'm, I'm glad that I've I've met and and I've had the experience of um, you know sharing a change room. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm going to start to wrap things up now in terms of um, in terms of this podcast, uh, and I really want to end in yourself as a coach uh, and moving forward. Um, so, what values as a coach have you taken on to, to yourself? Um, so how would how do you think a player would describe you, 
uh, in terms of your values. Um, and, and how do you think your team will look? So when you're the first team manager of wherever we are in the future, um, how, how, how is your team going to look and what values do you carry as a coach? I think, again, first of all, I think one of the biggest things, I think it's about, it's about being a good human being and being a good person. I think, you know, yeah. I think I'll always be honest and upfront with players and, you know, regardless of, you know, whether you have to deliver good news or bad news, I think, you know, it's best to do it in, a, in an upfront and an honest way. And I think, you know, I think that's that's one of the biggest characteristics that I would like to portray that, you know, regardless of whether you're in my starting 11 or regardless of whether, you know, your surplus to requirements that I will treat you right and that I will, I will do things right by you as a player, you know, because at the end of the day, it's not about me as a coach, it's about the players and it's about trying to help them. And I think, you know, if, if I can do anything for that player, I will do it, you know, to, to help improve them or to help them out in any way. And as I said, that doesn't have to be someone that, you know, is, is helping me on a Saturday. That could be, that could be my 20th man who's, who's probably not played all season for me. You know, if there's anything I can do for them, that's going to help improve them, whether it be as a player or as a person, then 100% I'm going to go out my way to do that. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that I will try and portray going forward. And, and one of the things I have tried to, to take with me into my coaching. Um, so, yeah, so like, I think in terms of actual delivery of sessions and stuff like that, we can all get better. You know, we can all improve. You know, I don't think there's one person in the world that is, 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 has reached their limits or has reached their potential. You know, you look at Klopp, you look at Pep, and I think there's always room for improvement. I think you can always get better, and I think it's always striving to do that a little bit more to improve as a person and, and a, as a coach and, and players, you know, trying to improve as a player. And I think that's one thing for me that, you know, if I can do that and I can, I can help people as much as I possibly can, then I will do that. And, um, you know, if whether people like you as a person or they don't like you as a person, I think if they come away thinking that you've done your best for them, then then I will be happy, you know. So, um, in terms of my teams, if I got the if I get the opportunity to be a manager, you know, you know, we'd all like to play like Barcelona, Man City, um, but I think <laughs> I think it, I think when you go in a first team level, I think if you think you're going to go in and do that straight away, I think you're quite naive. Um, mm -hmm. I think you need to be you need to be astute. I think you need to be switched on and you need to be quite clever to, as to the players you have at your disposal. Um, you sure. know, so I think, you know, again, it's not about, again, I go back to it, it's not about you as a coach. I think when you have time, you know, if you have a couple of transfer windows and you have time to, to, to form a squad and to form a team of how you see football, I think, great but sometimes you don't get that opportunity and I think it's important that whatever job or you know wherever I go in I will 100% try and play a style of football that suits the players that I have at my disposal and then once you win games and you get that time then it's about trying to to get the people in that can you know play a possession based you know trying to build from the back trying to control possession trying to dominate teams through possession um, you know, making sure that players are are organised. You know, making yeah. sure that they they understand what you're expecting of them. They understand the roles. They understand exactly what you want them to do. You know, and then and I'm big on you know. I know I spoke about earlier about, about Craig wanting to get with. I like to see wingers. I like to see. I used to love playing with Gary McCoy, Stephen, and, and watching him. I, I like to see players that excite people. Um, I like to see players you know having freedom in the final third where they can get the ball and they can go and express themselves, you know, and, and again, that, that then goes into, you know, a big part of what I want to bring to a table and bring to a team is, is an enjoyability factor where the players come into work, they enjoy coming into work. And then I think that then transmits and translates onto the pitch where, you know, the fans then are coming and, and, and watching a brand of football that they actually enjoy watching, you know? So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so and I think probably the final thing that I want to see from my team is like a, a hunger and a relentlessness that, you know, they don't stop. You know, we talked about it earlier, like, you know, you might score in the 89th, you might score in the 94th minute, you know, that that will to go all the way and, and not and not stop short. You know, if you're winning 2-0, I don't want to see, see the team stopping playing. I don't want to see them 
you know, got stopping going for the trolls. And I think it's important that, you know, they have that relentlessness and they, they keep going um, and they keep trying to, to you know, tr- keep trying to win the game right up until the last minute. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I think what you've pretty much said on the early stage of that is it, it really depends on the club, um, their values, um, choosing the right club maybe for you um, because I, I, I don't believe that every single opportunity to manage a first team is the right one for a coach. Um, I've made the I've made the mistake myself going into a club where I probably didn't know enough about what they wanted the long term goal to be, and that certainly didn't match my long term sort of ambition. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't I don't think that was a good match, um, and I didn't maybe know enough going into that uh, about the football club and sort of the expectations. So I think. That comes into it, um, and then, like you say, an important one: who's available now, and, and and what can you add to the squad? So it's nice to it's nice to sort of get your take on, firstly, how your team is going to look, and I think how your team is going to look, and that and you talk about the desire and that um, the hunger and that belief. I think you're going to implement that in your team, whatever. Um, so yeah. w- w- whatever the level of play is and the standard of the um, yeah. that that is there in the football club, I think that's going to be like a that's going to be a core element of. Of you. Yeah, that that that's going to be a given. Huh? Like, like, and actually, as a player, it used to frustrate me when when the manager would come in and say, "Ah, oh, you've worked really hard." Like that for me is a given. Huh? That that's you shouldn't be getting praise. I don't think for working hard. Like you know, that's that's something that I expect. I expected to do as a player. I expected to go out and work hard, and and I never needed a pat on the back for for that. You know, so I think you know yeah. praising praising your team for doing for working hard. You know. You, for me, is you know it, it shouldn't happen. I think that's because that's that's the minimum that you expect is that your team goes out and they work really really hard. You know, hundred percent, hundred percent. And lastly, for you, um, I know this has come out of a really strange time, um, and we had a little chat for your hand, and you said there was um, there could have been things coming up in the pipeline. Um, but to to get onto that. The final thing is then your, your departure from Hearts, um, how that come about, and, and and I know we all read different things, so it'd be nice to hear um, that and where you want sort of, I don't want to say your future because it's going to be such a long journey now. You're still so young as a coach. Um, it's going to be a long path towards the, 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 a real big <laughs> end goal. Um, but what what do you want next? Um, moving on from talking about your exit from Hearts. Yeah, I think you know. Talking about the eggs from Hearts, I think you know one thing. I I've got a lot, a lot of time for Hearts. They gave me a great opportunity to go in at a really, really good level, and and I want to see them succeed. I want to see them do well, um, and I totally understand. You know, um, you know, a new manager coming in, he wants his own staff, and I, I totally get that. I, I, you know, that's something that you know it just it's the norm in football. Um, so yeah, so you know, I have no. I think mm-hmm. the biggest thing, and, I, and I've spoke about, and it's been it's been in the press, and you know, was was the word. And now, look, he might he might have been uh, it might have been tran- a loss in translation or whatever. But you know, I think I think the question, you know, a person's honesty and and say they're not trustworthy was that was the biggest thing that you know, and that's you know, I spoke about it. That's something that I would pride myself on, you know, and to have someone come out and say that they can't trust you was was extremely hurtful, um, um, and it was it was I felt it was below the belt, and that was kind of why I I then responded to it, and you know should I have responded to it? Look, I did, and 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 I stick to it, and um, but look, I've got nothing against the manager, nothing against the club. I actually have a lot of time for the club. I actually out with that, I actually left the club in really good terms, and you know, um, you know, it was very very amicable how we how we left, and I actually. You know when when the new manager came in and and it was it was it was known that he wanted to bring his own staff in. I, I spoke to Anne about you know moving on just to to try and help the the situation and you know because I didn't want to be hanging around um, and making things difficult and so yeah, yeah so so yeah so it, it was it was it was great to be there. I really enjoyed it and as I said, I've not got any any bad ill or uh, any bad feeling towards the club so. But in terms of myself going forward, yeah, I think, you know, I'm just, I just would like to get back involved, whether that's, you know, helping someone out, um, you know, because I still think 
you know, I said it earlier in the in the chat. You know, you can you can learn something from everyone, and I think, you know, whether that's in a, in a management role or an assistant manager or a, or a coach role, I think, you know, I just I think it's it's good to get back involved. And I'm looking. I felt I felt like I was ready. I've enjoyed my time with my family and my kids, and you know, obviously, um, the last wee while has has made it a bit more difficult. But that's that's. That's just the way the world is just now with this whole yeah. uh, virus. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, in in difficult situations, and um, I appreciate that. I'm very, very fortunate that you know, um, you know, I have a very talented wife who has who has a cake business that she's she's doing really well with at the minute. So it's mm-hmm. kind of um, give me probably that bit of freedom, a bit of time to to look about and see what's out there at the minute. And you know, I'm obviously yeah. um, I'd be quite open to to going abroad um, as I wanted to do it as a player. So, yeah, so yeah. I, I wouldn't mind Amazing. doing it as a coach because mm-hmm. I think, you know, you can learn from, you know, different cultures and different styles and, you know, so, mm. you know, but I think, you know, obviously I, I know Scottish, the Scottish league very, very well and I know um, how it works up here. So obviously that's probably where I, I'd probably be, be strongest, but, you know, I wouldn't mind putting myself out of my comfort zone and going abroad somewhere and, and trying and maybe having a bit of warm weather coaching, you know, it'd be nice to get yeah. a guess, yeah, I was gonna mention. Stuck, yeah, instead of being stuck in Scotland where it's absolutely Baltic. So um <laughs> but no, no, it, look it, it, I, I, I we'll see what pops up and what presents itself and um but no look I, I, as I said I've, I I loved my time at hearts um and again very, very grateful for the opportunity to go in and coach at, at such a fantastic football club and and um, we shall see what what comes up in in the next week. while brilliant so john it's been amazing to hear it i can hear the hunger and the, the desire in your voice and that that passion for football that i, I really think everyone listening will will kick up on um it's been amazing and i think the experiences that, that you've had um i've loved every minute of listening for it so i can only say a big thanks for thanks for joining me on here today no thank you very much for having me on i really appreciate it no problem. So if you've enjoyed listening to podcasts as much as I have, um, then please follow Football Coaching 101 uh, on social media and search for Non-League Nosh to hear stories and experiences of players and coaches from non-league all the way through to the very top of the professional game. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.